Hello and welcome to our recording for this the sixth Sunday after Trinity. Thank you to those of you who gave me feedback on our online services and the content. Uh, actually only uh, three people, well two, two individuals and one couple, got in touch with me. Uh, one of the individuals said that they, they really liked things as they were and they, they would be sad if we cut back uh, the, the online content. Uh, one person said they quite enjoyed the, the prayers and the hymn but it was mainly the sermon that they watched for and they would understand if we cut back. Uh, and one person said it was the sermon that they really watched for uh, but if we did cut back could we keep the reading? So taking all of that into account we will be phasing out the full uh, services, reading, sermon, prayers, hymn that we've been having. Uh, I'm not saying you won't ever get other content uh, Sunday by Sunday. Uh, if, if we manage to record something live or if there's a, a special something that we think is worth adding on, we will do so. Um, but we're, we're no longer gonna regularly going to do uh, particularly the, the prayers and the, and the hymn side of things. Um, uh, and so today, for example, um, there aren't going to be any prayers. I, I am going to give you the reading now. Uh, and then I was at Albury this morning and they do actually uh, were recording their sermon. They were Zooming their, their service, actually. So I asked them to record it and I've got the sermon, which I'm going to share with you. It's the, it's the same readings that were at Shear and Peaslake this morning. Um, so so the theme is, is, is exactly the same as you would have got had you been uh, at uh, Peace Lake or Shear this morning, although obviously the sermon is slightly different. It was John Aston who was preaching there. I'm actually going to give you a hymn today as well uh, because I've got the whole of Albury service recorded. Um, I'm going to, going to share one of those uh, hymns with you as well. So the, the reading uh, in all three churches this morning, uh, both Shear, Peace, Peace Lake, uh, Albury where I was, uh, and, and probably in Chilworth as well, um, was from Mark, the Gospel reading was from Mark chapter 6, beginning at the first verse. And it goes like this. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph, and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with him? And they took offence at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honour, except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to Christ. I speak in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, I welcomed the congregation uh, here at Albury at the beginning uh, of the service. Uh, welcome to uh, those who are watching online, both those uh, from this parish who are watching via Zoom. Uh, and I'm actually going to use the recording of this uh, to share with the, the Shear parish as well um, later on today. So welcome to you if you're watching this at some point in the future. Um, Thursday, uh, last Thursday, uh, was not only the date of the UK election. Uh, also, obviously, I'm sure you know, it was the, the date of American Independence Day, the 4th of July. Uh, and it was also, which you probably didn't know, the 20th anniversary of my ordination uh, as a deacon. Uh, I was ordained in Gloucester Cathedral uh, on the 4th of July, 2004, as a deacon, and then a year later, um, as a priest, but it was the 20th anniversary of when I first started to wear um, a dog collar. Um, uh, sadly, my, my parents weren't able to be there for my, my ordination, and in fact, my mother died just, uh, well, she died in September 2003, so she died uh, just, just the year before, less than a year um, before that. Um, uh, she, was, she was pleased that I was becoming a priest, uh, but she was not um, a person of faith herself. In fact, neither of my parents 
uh, were people of faith. Uh, at one time, they'd probably both have said um, that they were atheists. Uh, but my dad, I think, um, softened a bit towards the end and perhaps would have described himself as an agnostic. Um, they were both uh, quite anti-church and particularly anti-Catholic for, for different reasons. Um, my father's father, my grandfather, who I very vaguely remember, he died when I was four, um, was actually born, a, was baptised a Catholic, uh, came from a Catholic family. In, in fact, the Heenies uh, were Catholic for <laughs> forever, um, up until uh, my, my father. Uh, my, my grandfather married an Anglican and my dad was baptised as an Anglican as a baby, but they weren't a church-going father. And my uh, my grandfather um, was quite pleased to leave the Catholic Church. Uh, he had some unfortunate experiences when his father died, and so he was quite anti-Catholic, and he passed that on to my dad. Um, my mum's reason was quite different. Uh, she and her slightly older sister, when they were very young, uh, were put in a home. Uh, and it was a home run by Catholic nuns. Uh, my mum was about five and my, my auntie about seven at the time. Uh, and the nuns were very strict, very strict. And uh, um, as I'm sure you can imagine uh, in those days they were, we were talking the late, late 30s, early 40s, so during the war. And um, what was interesting was the, the different res reaction the two sisters had to that. My auntie, my auntie Sheila, um, actually became a strong, a very strong Christian herself because of her experience of living with the nuns. She, she responded well to the discipline, the order, etc., uh, etc. Et she, she became a Christian herself, uh, not a Catholic, but, but an Anglican. And uh, she was certainly in my family growing up, she was the one person who had a very strong faith. She gave me my first Bible, etc., um, etc. Et my mum, on the other hand, who perhaps was uh, a little more rebellious and a little less conformist than my auntie, uh, she reacted very badly to being in the home. Uh, and actually, she, she, well, she was very angry, shall we say, at the least throughout her life about the way she'd been treated as a child by them. Uh, and I'm sure this was a big contributory factor to, to her uh, lack of faith and her actually being quite anti. Uh, and whereas, as I say, with my father in, in his last couple of years, he, he, he died. Um, I'd just become a Christian, actually, when, when, when Dad died. I became a Christian in 1989. Uh, Dad died in 1992. So I was able to have some conversations with him about my newfound faith. I'd, uh, as I say, I'd only become a Christian myself uh, a couple of years earlier. Uh, and he had to retire early through ill health, and he became quite thoughtful, contemplative, philosophical. We had conversations about faith. Uh, and I, I, think, I think by the end, he certainly believed in, in some kind of life after death, uh, if not fully uh, in front of us uh, professing uh, to be a Christian. Uh, my mum, on the other hand, when, uh, when she died, uh, and she was, it was cancer, and she was in hospital for a while before the end, uh, I did have a conversation with her, and she was both very clear that she didn't believe in God, and also, um, actually, I did ask her, but do you at least, mum, you know, believe in, in some kind of life after death? And she, she said, do you know, I don't think I actually do, son. So, um, now, why am I sharing all this with you? Well, in our gospel reading, we heard how Jesus himself went back to his hometown of Nazareth. Uh, his ministry had begun at this stage. He'd done some miracles. He'd been preaching in uh, the local towns uh, around Nazareth. Uh, he went back to Nazareth. He'd got his disciples by this stage. They, they went back to Nazareth, to his hometown. Uh, and as we, as we heard Richard uh, uh, dramatically read to us and give us a real flavor of, uh, of the anger and, and the, the, the accusations and the rejection of, of his, not only the villagers of, of where he grew up, who all knew him, is this not the carpenter's son? Is this not, is this not little Jesus that we saw you know, running around and uh, being coming from this very ordinary family, uh, and, and now he's telling us that he's the Messiah, etc., etc., uh, and, and quite forcibly rejecting him. But, but interestingly, his own family as well would have been part of that. We don't, uh, we don't know Mary's reaction, but it specifically says that his brothers and sisters, and it names some of his brothers, uh, that his brothers and sisters were, were part of the crowd um, that, that rejected him. 
Um, uh, and so uh, I don't know if you, uh, you will uh, understand this experience yourself, if this has been the experience of your own life, but you know, I'm quite happy to stand up here uh, and preach to all of you and those of you at home. Uh, and I'm quite happy to share my faith with, with neighbours, with friends, with colleagues, uh, with people that I, that I meet. Uh, I have, a, a, to a degree, an advantage, I think. Uh, it's amazing how often wearing the dog collar will engender a conversation. Uh, I was up at Newlands Corner um, a while ago w wearing my dog collar and two different people came up to me and started conversations about faith. Uh, and I'm very happy to do that. But with my own family, I actually find it really hard. Um, uh, and, you know, even, even both my parents, when they were dying, uh, it, it, was, it was quite an effort for me to, to have those conversations with them because I suppose partly because of the the different relationship that I had with them. You know, they were my, my mum and dad, and I did, I did find that particularly difficult. And even with my, my own siblings, even, even with my own children sometimes, not so much with my children, uh, but, but with my own brother and sister. My sister, uh, my sister does have a faith, actually, and she will come to church with me, but she's not a regular practicing Christian. Uh, my brother is, is like mum and dad, uh, and perhaps more like mum, uh, a, str a strong atheist still. He, he, will, he will have none of the nonsense that I've uh, given my life to. Uh, uh, and for a while, that caused problems, actually. We, 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 we didn't really talk to each other much. We, it wasn't that we stopped talking to each other, but we certainly didn't have the relationship that we had as children for quite some years. That's uh, the fact that he moved to Australia added to that. It wasn't because of me becoming a Christian that he moved to Australia. Well, I don't think so, anyway. No, I'm sure it wasn't. Uh, but, uh, but actually, we, we, we have strengthened our relationship uh, a bit in recent years, which, is, which has been good. But, but faith is still a, a topic which is not really um, on our agenda. Um, of course, uh, I can still have conversations with, with them about my faith, but I'm, I'm very careful to share with them my faith. This isn't about me telling them what they should believe, but, but if, the, if the opportunity arises and, and it seems right, I'm happy to share with them what I feel God has done for me uh, in my life. At our men's Bible study in Shear, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, um, we were having a conversation about how we share our faith with people and, and what we should share with them. Uh, and, and some of the members of the group were very happy uh, to, to have conversations with, uh, with work colleagues, with neighbours, with, with whatever about Jesus. Interestingly, they were generally uh, young men who were quite new in their faith, still in that kind of early honeymoon period, shall we say, of their faith. Uh, but it was, it was actually encouraging to the rest of us and a, a reminder to the rest of us that, uh, that actually we should, we should still do that when we get the chance, when we get the opportunity. Um, but equally, we were clear that, that the way to do that is, at least in the first instance, by, by talking about ourselves. This is my faith. This is what I believe, not this is what you should believe. Uh, and also we were clear that it's most effective when it's done through an existing relationship, uh, when, when it's somebody we, who already knows us, who trusts us, who, who recognises uh, that, that we have something in our lives that might be worthwhile, um, rather than uh, telling them this is what you have to believe, this is how you should lead your life. At our eight o'clock sermon uh, service, we talked a little bit about the second half of our reading, uh, where Jesus sends the di disciples out. And basically, they go from town to town, knocking on doors, telling people that they should repent. Uh, and I suggested uh, to, to the small group that were there um, that that probably wasn't the best way uh, for us to evangelize today. If you, if you went into a, a town where you weren't known, banged on, the door, on a, a complete stranger's door and told them that they needed to repent, I think you'd get uh, fairly short shrift, uh, perhaps as uh, some of our candidates got as they were knocking on doors uh, over the previous weeks. Um, but if you, if, you, if you meet someone and just share the, your own life with them, that's a very different thing. And if part of that is sharing your faith, that's a very diff diff different thing. Uh, and I would certainly encourage us all uh, to do that whenever we get the chance, guided by the Spirit, uh, 
when we feel the Holy Spirit is saying, yes, this is an opportunity to talk about your faith, that we do so. Very, very rarely, you might get the Holy Spirit telling you, you need to tell this person that there's something in their life that needs to be changed. That's a very, in my experience, that's quite a rare thing, but, but it does happen. Uh, and I, I know, perhaps Diane more than me really, would sometimes get what we, what we used to call in our evangelical days a word of knowledge, that sometimes the Holy Spirit would very clearly tell her that she should go and, and pass a message from God on to a person. But that's very rare and you have to be very careful about that. I wonder if those nuns, if they knew what was going to happen to my mum over her life, if they knew how anti-church, anti-God uh, their treatment of her would make her f for decades and decades and decades afterwards, I wonder if perhaps they'd, they'd have behaved slightly differently towards her if they treated her um, in a slightly different way. Uh, and we need, to, we need to bear that in mind. We need to remember that if we plant a seed uh, and it's a good seed, then we can just leave that to God. Uh, to, to, to tend and water that seed over the years to come. And it's, it's down to the Holy Spirit what happens. But equally, if we, if we plant a negative seed, if we do something that either um, people see as hypocritical or if we are too overbearing, too forceful, uh, or we mistime the way that we share our faith to people, it can actually do the opposite as it did uh, with my mum. Uh, and as Jesus once said, you know, woe be to you, uh, who turn away these, these young ones. And that can be young, people who are young in faith or have no faith just as much as literally young people. Better that a millstone were tied around your neck and you were thrown into a lake. So, so turning people away from God by our behavior or by being too pushy with our faith at the wrong moments um, can actually do as much, can do damage, uh, whereas we need to be very sensitive but take the opportunity to share the love of God uh, and the forgiveness and the mercy of God when we can. That aside, and I, and I hope we're encouraged to do that with people who we meet and we know, we may still, as I've said earlier, find that very difficult with our own family. Even Jesus kind of turned his back on Nazareth. Uh, he, he was unable to do uh, many miracles there. Uh, the fact that the town was against him, he, 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 he let them be. Um, so with our own families, that can be very difficult. Um, uh, and I don't have any great words of advice for you. If you have a family member uh, who you know is not a Christian, who doesn't know God, uh, and that saddens you, uh, then, uh, as I say, I, I don't have any foolproof way of changing that. All I can say is don't separate yourself from them. Stay in relationship with them. That's important. Uh, uh, let them see uh, how much you love God and what a, what a positive difference it makes to your life. Be ready to share when you can uh, and otherwise leave it to God. Um, but most of all, please do pray for them. If you have family members or neighbours or people you know who don't know Jesus, then please do try and pray for them by name regularly. Uh, because um, I think one of the reasons I became a Christian is that I know my auntie Sheila prayed for me for years and years, right through uh, to say I was, I was 30 by the time I became a Christian. But I, I know that from the moment I was born, she was praying for me. And, and I think uh, that that was one of the factors that came to me knowing God. Share the love of God with people when you get the chance. Be guided by the Holy Spirit, be sensitive. Pray for those you know who don't know God, and particularly perhaps uh, your own families. But most of all, love them regardless of what they believe. Amen. We, we are part of a, a family here, uh, that we are all adopted into God's family. Uh, and we have, we have the love of each other uh, to, to strengthen us and guide us, uh, particularly if things are difficult in our, in our own families at home. Uh, and let's remind ourselves of that now by standing to sing, Father God, I wonder.
唱。